prior to the 70th week. So prior to the unveiling of the or unsealing of the first horse and the second seal judgment of the red horse where peace is taken from the earth. So I think that this is separate from that. And, and so the way I, the way I look at this is kind of a chain of chain reaction uh, event. So think about the world is as it is today. We have uh, incredibly high political polarization in the United States w between the two parties and all the different, uh, uh, you know, agendas going forward right now. We have uh, tension in the Middle East. We've got conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, his Israel and, and uh, Hezbollah, uh, possible factions that may rise up from Judea and Samaria, or, the, or what they call the West Bank. Um, then you also have the tensions with uh, Iran. Then you have uh, Turkey really wanting to, to take over the rest of Cyprus. You have conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan. You have conflicts now between uh, the government of Pakistan and the government of Afghanistan, which is the Taliban. And now you have con you, you have like a, what I call rumors of war now between um, China wanting to repatriate uh, Taiwan back to the mainland. And by repatriate, I mean, they take it over, you know, and conquer, conquer it. And then uh, North Korea wanting to take back and unify the Korean Peninsula under Kim Jong-un. So, and then on top of that, you still have the, the violence and the lawlessness in Northern Mexico that's bleeding into America with all these cartels that are uh, running riot down there. So there's a lot of, lot of things happening around the world. That's not even all the things, that's just a handful of things, right? But Russia right now is, in my my view, even going back to that first interview you, you and I did when you were asking me about what did I think Russia was going to do, and they hadn't invaded yet, and I I think I told you I was like, well, you know, they've got all of these assets on the border, they've got all of their military equipment, they've got their tanks, they've got helicopters, they got planes, they're even moving up medical facilities and hospitals, uh, mobile you know mobile units. To me, it seems like they're going to do it because you don't move all that equipment there. I mean, it costs, you know, millions of rubles a day just to, to make that stuff happen. It's incredibly expensive. So it's either the world's biggest um, bluster, uh, you know, show of force, but not do anything, or they're actually going to do what they're, what they, it seems like they're doing. So um, we're looking at all these other scenarios and these people are beginning to act very strange and very differently than they have in the past. Kim Jong-un is doing things differently. Um, Xi Jinping is doing things differently. So there's, we need to not listen to what they say. We need to watch what they're doing. And so I think what we're, we're getting ready to see is the number one point in my whole scenario is we keep poking the Russian bear. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is Vladimir Putin has repeatedly come out and said he does not have any qualms about using nuclear bombs on his enemies. If, it, if, the, if the West, NATO, whoever crosses whatever the red lines he sets, so I, that sounds like bluster to a lot of people, but I, I mean, I kind of take them seriously. Like, I, I think that, that I don't know that he would nuke people, but I think that he would absolutely carry out a very full on, uh, full throttle uh, assault on Ukraine. Because right now, I think from the beginning, they've been fighting Ukraine with their hand, one hand tied behind their back. They've not really wanted to press too hard into Ukraine because from Vladimir Putin's perspective, I mean, um, Kiev is still a very significant uh, holy site to him. That's the birthplace of the Orthodox Christianity. And so he's been very cautious in how he's done things. But that's obviously been um, taken advantage of by Zelensky and by others who've you know gone and done things like blowing up bridges, uh, blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline and other things. So it's, it's aggravated this thing. So instead of just settling on the Donetsk region, uh, the, the Donbass and, and repatriating those to Russia, I think... If we cross this red line, he's going to push straight through Ukraine and no holds bar, uh, punch into uh, what they call the Salty Gap, which is the little strip of land that that uh, separates Poland from Kaliningrad, which is that little Russian enclave on the other side between Poland and Lithuania. And when they punch through that Salty Gap, that will cut off the Baltic states from the rest of NATO. And I think he will push into to those nations as well. And when he does that, um, he'll have the support and uh, backing of the Belarus army there, and as well as probably agreements and arrangements he's made with China prior to even going into Ukraine to begin with. So I think there were some backroom deals that were done between him and Xi Jinping back in early February. 
uh, 22, when we're, they were when they're having the Olympics there in China, uh, they were having these secret meetings together. And I think they made some kind of a deal like, hey, if we we're going to go into Ukraine and we got this, but if we ever need, if, you know, if it could push comes to shove and we end up going further and having to do some other things, uh, we need you to support us. In exchange, Russia then will give China their uh, UN Security Council a vote of approval for their repatriation of Taiwan. Um, this now splits all of the NATO forces, U.S., NATO, it splits them now into two different theaters. So you have a European theater, and then you have a Pacific theater. Now, it's bad enough right now for the military because we're they are stretched very, very thin. And NATO, the other member nations, aren't that strong yet. They're getting there, and I think that the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a wake-up call for them to start rebuilding their armies. And some nations are taking this seriously, like Poland, but they're not there yet. So, but what this does is when China makes its move on Taiwan, subsequent to Russia moving into the uh, Baltic states, which they want to bring back into their um, their nation under their boundaries, their borders, now they have other things that they can play, uh, other things that they can use. They can, there's the uh, Gotland Island, which is the uh, little island that uh, belongs to Sweden, but it's basically right in the middle of the Baltic Sea. And anybody that controls that is going to control all the traffic that goes in and out of the Baltic Sea area right there. So that is a very short jump from Kaliningrad, where uh, Russia has uh, tens of thousands of troops sitting there just to go take that little island. Now they can control the Baltic Sea. And there's also all of these underwater uh, data cables that connect uh, Europe to the United States, uh, internet cables that um, they could attack and destroy. And if they do that, that will cripple internet communications around the world. And um, right now, Ireland is not part of NATO. So their they're coastlines, all of this area where this, these cables are underwater, it's all unguarded. So that's a very lucrative target that they could take out and they can start doing some serious damage without ever having to fire a nuke. So, but with that said, it's a chain reaction, and this is the only way that it works, is when Russia makes this move, that's a signal to China to make their move. And now China can give North Korea the green light, because North Korea is starting to do things very, very strangely now, even stranger than they normally have. Um, and when that when that goes off, uh, North Korea, and this is just a theory, but it makes sense to me, uh, you play to your strengths, right? If you're, a, if you're a despot, you're a tyrant, a dictator, you play to your strengths. So what is, what's the main difference between North Korea and South Korea, just in your estimation? Oh, mine? Well, their leadership is an obvious, um, obviously there, there's a significant difference between the two of them. So, I mean, just looking at it from that standpoint, I mean, you have Kim Jong-un, who is willing to line him up, himself up with anybody who is anti-America. So, and also much more aggressive than you're gonna find in South Korea. So when you mention aligning South Korea and North Korea, that would be Kim Jong-un's desire. Why would he not? Yeah, well, I mean, and, and if you've seen that photo, and I'm sure pretty much everybody that's watching this has probably seen the photo of the Korean Peninsula at night. And on the north, it's just completely yeah. blacked out. Yeah. And yeah. in the south, it's just lit up. I mean, everything right. is electric. I spent a year and a half there. It's very high tech. Very, it's like Japan in the sense that there, everything is digital. Everything's electrical. Well, if you're North Korea and all of your systems are antiquated and analog and dating back to the 1950s, but you have nuclear technology and you have a nuclear sat two nuclear satellites floating around the Earth, um, it seems to me that the their first thing that they would do would be to detonate an EMP, detonate one of those satellites that's armed over their own airspace, because that would, if they do it at the right altitude, that would create that um, uh, umbrella of where everything inside of that umbrella is going to be wiped out. That's a, that's connected to a digital uh, circuit, or you know, it's going to fry everything basically. Hey, let me so ask when you, you fry everything, go ahead. Yeah, are you saying detonated over South Korea? No, detonated over North Korean airspace. So, okay, go ahead. 60 percent 60, 60 of North Korea is is not connected to anything electrical. Right. <laughs> so when you think about that yeah. that picture, how when you turn up at nighttime, it's dark in North Korea. Right. They don't have 
it's not going to impact them the same way that it will impact South Korea. It will cripple South Korea in a mi- nanosecond. So it's going to bring. It will have. Yeah. It'll have marginal effects to North Korea. Right. Yeah. So it's going to bring South Korea down to to the level of North Korea. It levels the playing field. Yes. Plus, you also have the problem with South Korea. They won't know how to deal with it because they're used to operating like we are here in the Western world. Yeah, and so their military equipment, a lot of their military stuff is hardened, but all of their inf- civilian infrastructure is none of that's hardened. I mean, it would it would bring that country to a screeching halt, and it would be incredibly uh, disastrous for them. I mean, imagine an EMP hitting Los Angeles, this downtown lot in the in the middle of the day, in the middle of rush hour, whatever, and just everything dies right then and there. In North Korea, minimal impact. South Korea, it would have devastating impact. So now think about U.S. forces in South Korea, U.S. forces in Okinawa and and, and, in the Philippines and everywhere else. Now you're taking that Pacific theater and you're splitting it in two now. Now U.S. forces or Western forces are having to deal with the threat of China and trying to invade Taiwan and also North Korea launching its attacks on Seoul. So they would launch that EMP uh, attack on Seoul or South Korea because it's going to impact the whole Korean peninsula. Um, And then uh, at the same time, uh, you know, now that's splitting the U.S. forces twice. And then I think the fourth scenario is where Iran makes a play on Saudi Arabia. So all of this stuff is going on now. U.S. forces are divided between a European theater, a Pacific theater, and now the Pacific theater is divided twice. And now Iran makes a move, and it doesn't even have to be on all of Saudi Arabia. It can just be on Bahrain. It can be on some of those Gulf Emirates states down there. Uh, and they have... Uh, not only do they have a large army, uh, it's about almost 600,000 soldiers plus another 200,000, but they have a ton of militias and other Shia loyal, loyalists and folks that are loyal to um, the Ayatollah around that area. So uh, most of Iraq is Shia. Um, the Sunnis are, are a minority in that country, which is why Saddam Hussein, who was a Sunni, uh, was so hard and, and, and had his thumb down so hard on, on uh, uh, any type of rebellion in there. Um, but most of, of Iraq is Shia, Shia. They have the Houthis. They have uh, other agents in Syria and places that they could just kind of come in and they could they could retake uh, Mecca and Medina, as well as uh, capturing their vast oil reserves in the eastern side of the country. And even if they just took Bahrain, I mean that would be a huge uh, blow to the United States because our seventh fleet is there. So I mean, it, it, there's a lot of different ways that this could play out. And, uh, but my point is, is by this point, U.S. forces, Western forces are now divided four different ways across the world. And that's a scary scenario because right now we're not even meeting our, rec- you know, recruitment uh, commitments on a yearly basis. So it's, it's, it's a nightmare scenario that, that I've, I think is a really possible uh, a thing that could happen here in the not too distant future, especially with so many countries having elections, like 76 countries around the world right now are going to have elections this year. Um, so it benefits certain members who want this kind of crisis so they can just bypass the election or put it off or declare martial law or whatever. And uh, you know, they can just stay in power. So um, this thing could trigger about three different ways. It could trigger by accident. It can trigger by a slow burn or it could trigger by um, intentional. So accident, most of every, there's like nine or 10 nations in the world that have nuclear weapons. Most of these nations um, all have some type of automated systems to, for, for varying things. Something could accidentally happen. These systems can accidentally trigger. Um, they're all aging systems. All the stuff that we have in, America, in the United States, all that stuff is aging. Um, so anyways, the point is, is that accidents can happen. A, a stray missile could land into Poland. That could trigger a response from NATO. I mean, there's any different number of ways this could play out. Uh, the slow burn is that we, we're seeing it today. We're seeing all the rhetoric, the, the war rhetoric, being ramped up and ramped up and ramped up. And at a certain point, you're going to get to a point where you can't walk it back down without losing face or losing momentum in your war or you know losing the war altogether. Um, so I think that that slow burn could actually... Uh, actualize into to actual conflict or war between NATO proper and Russia, which would trigger the other things, right? And then the last thing is uh, intentional. And if you remember the movie, um, I don't know, it was a book first, but uh, Some of All Wars, mm-hmm. back uh, by Tom Clancy, this is 91, I think. 
But in the book, he has this scenario where these uh, European elites, they steal a, um, a nuclear bomb, and then they make a dirty bomb out of it, and then they put it in Baltimore. They detonate it, almost kills the president. And so the, the Americans think it's the Russians. The Russians are getting ready because they're attacked by another uh, force. Uh, they think it's the Americans, so they're almost you know about to kill each other in, in World War III, nuclear war scenario. And really, it was this other group who was trying to get them to destroy each other so they could take over. You know, so it could be intentional by some, you know, bad actors as well. So, Okay, so you laid out a lot of different scenarios with some real possibilities, maybe even probabilities, you could call them. Um, so is there any fear of the U.S. with whether it be Russia or China or Kim Jong-un or Iran? Is there... Any fear whatsoever? Well, I don't. I don't think it'll be anything like a red dawn scenario where we've got, you know, enemy planes flying over the U.S. and airborne Soviet soldiers or Chinese or whoever jumping out. I don't think it'll be like that at all. I think what'll happen is if tensions uh, or even conflict uh, becomes a reality between the United States and China. Um, there's probably a, a good number of sleeper cells in America now that could be activated. The Chinese could also um, buy um, buy some loyalty from the cartels, or maybe you have some prearranged agreements. Hey, if the U.S. attacks us, we'll give you ten billion dollars or whatever that they're going to give them to start, you know, uh, trying to take over Arizona or Southern California or the border of Texas. I mean, so then all of the National Guardsmen's that from the different states that would have deployed with these other units to forward sites in Europe or the Pacific now are having to be focused back on the border because the cartels are now running over law enforcement. They're running over um, all these border states. And, and then you have sleeper cell activations, uh, terrorist attacks all over. I mean, there could be any number of scenarios, but yeah, I mean, there is, there's definitely things to be cautious of and weary of in this scenario because it's not just going to be war happening over there. Um, I think there's a real potential for us to start feeling a lot of it here. Um, anyway, so that would be a fifth way that the U.S. forces are then divided. Uh, they're having to be rebrought brought back to the U.S. again to guard the borders or guard against cartels or whatever the, the case is going to be. Now, here's a here's a thing that I didn't know until just a few days ago. Uh, when the Democrats uh, started making their trips over to Taiwan, I think it was Nancy Pelosi, um, this was a huge, huge uh, slap in the face to the Chinese, and they retaliated. And how they retaliated is that um, they they took some things off of their war on drugs. Um, so they took off the list of things that they care about as fentanyl. Instead, they began shipping all this fentanyl to uh, Mexico, which is then uh, brought across our border, and now it's killing you know hundreds of thousands of Americans. Um, and so there, you know that's that's a way that they can retaliate. So they do have relationships with these cartel members. Um, and we know that through all the human smuggling and these, these uh, immigrant trains that are coming up, there are Chinese all throughout there that are, you know, helping facilitate a lot of this stuff. And then they're coming in with them and then bringing their people in as well. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of scenarios that could play out that would be incredibly scary. Now, to the EMP thing I talked about with North Korea, back in 2004, um, I forget the guy's name, uh, Stephen Fry or Peter Fry or something, was doing a lot of briefings to Congress about the threat of an EMP. So from Americans' perspective, it was always like the North Koreans would launch this EMP or the satellite that was armed with a low-yield low uh, nuclear bomb in there, and then they would detonate it over the United States. And that's certainly a possibility, but really, I, I think it's more realistic to think that they would detonate it over their own airspace so they could, because their main goal is to reunify the Korean Peninsula, not to conquer the United States. Um, so their goal is to is limited to that right there. So I think they're going to do that to whatever, to the greatest effect that they can. And then following an EMP attack, they would just, the Seoul is within artillery range of, of, of uh, North Korea, the border there. And they have a tremendous amount of artillery that they can use to just make it level Seoul if they wanted to. And if, if it comes on the backside of an EMP, then that would be, um, they would probably be very successful in that. So you're laying out quite a uh, uh, quite a bit here, because so you have a war like this breaking out, and then we have the red horse of the Book of Revelation. We also have the Ezekiel chapter 38 war, 
all of these different things that we're looking at in the future, possibly not too distant future too, but I still, I still have a lot more questions. So when we look at the border, the southern border of the United States, we know millions of people have come across the border, mainly men, military age, um, and we know, as you mentioned, Chinese nationals, we have Muslims coming over, Somalis. Uh, from what I understand, the, they've been, there's been training camps for years here in America. And I'll read about them. They'll pop up every now and then. I was, uh, somebody told me about a, an entire hotel that is used in New York City for training. The, the only thing that's staying there are these immigrants that are coming over. Not Mexican immigrants, but just other immigrants that are coming over, and it's all men. And you look at this, and, and, and I remember Glenn Beck talking about this, I'd say years ago. And so we're looking at, we're years into this, Pete, and we know the borders are blown open. We know that we have uh, people on the inside of the current administration that are complicit in this, or the borders would be closed. So when you talk about this all happening from sleeper cells, it doesn't just seem like a possibility. It seems like, look, it's going to happen. Yeah, and they they could use that. They by they I mean the the current administration could use. Um, uh, let's just say that a dozen different attacks happen uh, around the United States on any given day of this year, leading up to the election. They could use that as a pretense to cancel the election, because uh, this would also come in the heels of like cyber attacks and and other things. And we're starting to see these happen quite a bit, um, possibly even the ship that we'll talk about in a little bit, but. Um, these cyber attacks on top of these, uh, the poly crisis, what Klaus Schwab was talking about, all of these different attacks happening in different places around the same time period could be just cause for the, the administration to declare some kind of martial law or delay or cancel the elections outright or, or something to that effect. I don't know how that would play out necessarily, but they'll use this, the Democrats, the left will use this as a, a crisis to exploit to their own benefit. So. Uh, I don't put it past them to be willingly uh, knowledgeable of these things that are ongoing in the United States ahead of time. And then they may let them play out just so they can uh, have that excuse down the road. So give them power. Um, but, you know, yeah, that's a scary thought. Yeah, but that, that is, I mean, obviously something is going on with the current presidential administration to have the borders so wide open. We know that. Uh, the Biden family has been bought out by the Chinese. I mean, it's all over the news, but nobody's going to jail for it. But so we look at we look at all these different dynamics and think th there's there's these total evil people. It looks to me, in a sense, a coup has already been done it, within our own government. Yeah, yeah. I used to think that the, that the U.S. was collapsing, I, but I honestly, I've, I've kind of changed my mind on this to think that we've already collapsed. We're just kind of in the, the the death throes of it or whatever, the echoes of it. And so we're now just, uh, the government is a constitutional republic when it suits them and when, and when it doesn't suit them, when there's a moment of crisis, all that stuff is thrown out the window like we saw a few years ago when uh, we decided to slow the curve after a couple of weeks and then that two weeks yeah. turned into like a year you know, or whatever. Or four, or four um, years, but, some people are still living yeah. in that. But the, uh, you know, here's here's a couple of things, and here's why I think it's sooner hold, rather than can later. You, can you hold on one Go second? Ahead, I want you to carry on yeah. that thought. Um, I'm going to have you carry on with these couple of things. Could be sooner rather than later, along with the bridge and what happened in Baltimore yesterday. Uh, listen, everyone, we are switching over to the app and website only in about 15 seconds. So if you're on any of the other channels, then... Uh, Go over to HopeForOurTimes.com or the app, Hope For Our Times app, and we're going to be exclusively there where Pete's going to be able to talk about these other two things, along with the bridge yesterday. Also, I want to ask you, I have a question about China and Taiwan because um, I, I'm interested to hear your take on that. Um, and Israel, too, so there's a lot there. But with that, everybody, uh, let's switch on over to the app. And the website, and we will start there right now. If you're on YouTube, make sure, or one of the other channels, go on over there. All right, Pete, let's continue. I cut you off when you said these two things. 